Well, today we're going to talk about the chemistry of gases uh, for the last, uh, the conclusion to the grade 11 review. Um, so let's get started. Um, just uh, as a bit of trivia, I don't know if you were taught this or not, but this is just as a bit of trivia, uh, just something I found. Composition of the atmosphere, you can see here from a rather, rather dated textbook, uh, this this data would not be too far off from what it is now. Uh, the percent of nitrogen in the atmosphere is 78%. Uh, so basically, our atmosphere consists of almost 80% of nitrogen, which um, you know in humans wouldn't react at all, very non-reactive uh, for us. But the part that matters is oxygen um, in our atmosphere. And notice that uh, a lot of the other um, gases um, that we can think about as gases are listed and uh, they are much much lower in percent abundance in the atmosphere uh, compared with oxygen and nitrogen. So we just um, just thought uh, you'd uh, look at that and be interested. At any rate, um, we'll t talk about the relationship of pressure to volume and uh, uh, it sounds a little bit mundane. Uh, it's not something that you uh, kind of would think of doing, but let's say that we have a column here of under more or less the same temperature, we have these pressures and these volumes for, um, for uh, one mole of oxygen at zero degrees Celsius. So if we're going to keep the uh, temperature constant, that means that the volume has to change with the pressure to keep the temperature the same. So, you know, if we have a pressure that's very low, we need a volume that's very, very high. Or if we need, need a pressure that's, you know, relatively high, like one atmosphere compared with 0.1, uh, our volume has to be a lot lower than 224. So, you can see here, uh, this kind of works. This is just experimental data and notice that there's a bit of variation and you'd expect it because it's mother nature. It's just all just random data. But the random data seems to center around uh, a certain range of numbers. It doesn't deviate too far from 22.4. In fact, the average deviation is about 0.6. So very interesting uh, studying that table. And uh, so, uh, for the same amount of gas at constant temperature, as volume increases, temperature increases. As pressure increases, volume decreases. Remember, constant temperature, that's the trick. Pressure, volume, and temperature are all, all related to each other. And this is because of Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and Gay-Lussac's Law all working together. Uh, and of course, you're supposed to know those laws. In the table, the amount of oxygen is held constant about how many moles of O2 are accounted for. Um, the amount of oxygen is held constant. Remember, exactly one mole. So how many moles of O2 are accounted for? We, we said 32 grams. Well, that is exactly one mole. Uh, is the temperature part of SATP or STP? You look at the temperature, you know that, well, SATP, I believe the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, so that means zero degrees must be STP. Um, of course, pressure is not STP. Uh, pressure varies all over the place. And what do you notice about the product P times V? Well, as you can see here, it's very nearly the same. Now, let's talk about the universal gas law. Um, in the last slide, if PV is, if we accept P, P times V to be on average 22.4, is it possible to show that the number of moles of oxygen in the container is about one mole is claimed? Well, we also saw that T is zero degrees Celsius. And uh, now for T, to use the universal gas law, we must use kelvins, so we have to now convert that to 273.15 kelvins. And, uh, of course, we also need the universal gas law equation, PV equals NRT. Well, we already got the PV part, and we know what N is. It's 1. 
r is going to be a little problematic because we have to now go back to the last slide and i believe if i'm not mistaken p was measured in atmospheres not in kilopascals okay so if you remember what was on the last slide it was actually in atmospheres so we have to get an appropriate um an appropriate universal gas constant uh, and we have to use 0 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole per Kelvin as the universal gas constant instead of the familiar 8.314. The 8.314, remember, is for kilopascals, and we need atmospheres. So P was in atmospheres, V was in liters. When we multiply P by V, we get as our units liters atmospheres, and even though that doesn't seem to quite make sense, we keep it because that's the way the units are. And once we do our division and solve for n, you're going to notice all of the units will cancel out except for the moles. And when we solve for n, that's exactly what we get, 1.000 moles. We actually get the number of moles back that was claimed. So uh, it was uh, worked out fairly good here. So the secret here is to choose the correct R value, which has atmospheres. There are many, many different R values. In fact, I urge you to uh, look up the universal gas constant on Wikipedia, and they have, my God, what's, what must be 30 or 40 different values of R for every measurement known to man. So... Um, but the two most common ones is 8.314 and this other one here that I'm using, 0 0.082. Now, it is still possible to use 8.314, but that means you have to convert the pressure into kilopascals in order to use that number. Otherwise, you can't use it. So let's do a gas loss stoichiometry worked problem, a problem that's been worked out for you. Kerosene is a heavy fuel consisting mostly of decane. Uh, and here is the formula right there, in case you need it. And of course you will. Assume it's all decane and that a gas stove cooking a Thanksgiving turkey dinner is burning one kilogram of kerosene per hour. How many liters of oxygen is consumed per hour and assume STP? Answer, well first you need a balanced equation. So uh, we need to burn our C10H22 with an appropriate amount of oxygen to get our CO2 and H2O. And of course this all has to be balanced. I prefer whole numbers here because we could we, we would want to work out uh, this you know appropriately. And uh, the mole ratios also turn out to be whole numbers which is kind of cool too. So one kilogram of kerosene is 1,000 grams. Now, if you work out the molar mass of C10H22, you'll get 142.32 grams per mole. So you, here is the molar mass of the kerosene being burned. We multiply that by the stoichiometric ratio between oxygen and kerosene, 31 to 2. And we actually get 108 moles of oxygen is consumed every hour. That's a lot of oxygen. Okay, and uh, now, um, but we're not done yet. You see, this is moles of oxygen per hour. Now, if we're assuming STP, which is kind of a little bit, I know it's a little bit crazy because, you know, we're setting something on fire here and we have anything but STP, but, you know, for the simplicity of high school uh, chemistry, we'll stick to STP nevertheless, and we know how many moles of O2 came out of that every hour, and we multiply that by 22.4 liters per mole to work out the liters of oxygen consumed. 2,400 liters of oxygen consumed every hour. That's one hell of a fire. Okay, how many liters of carbon dioxide is produced per hour? Assume STP. Answer. Okay, 1,000 grams uh, divided by 142.32. This is liters of carbon dioxide produced. So we have to get the number of moles of CO2 produced. And if you look back here, we have 20 moles of CO2 for every 2 moles of C10H22 burned, and our stoichiometric ratio is here. So we have 1,000 grams of uh, kerosene 
Our molar mass again, stoichiometric ratio. We are converting moles of kerosene into moles of CO2. We get 70.3 moles of CO2. How many liters is that? Multiply by 22.4, we get 1.6 times 10 cubed, 1,600 liters of carbon dioxide consumed every hour. And that's it. That's the end of the series. I hope if you can uh, if you can survive through these videos and uh, and uh, do fairly well, I'm sure you can be feel fairly confident of making it through um, my uh, my course in grade 12 chemistry for summer school. And uh, good luck.